the definition of the word gap is that something is broken or there's something missing. So when we refer to the term the generation gap, I think it actually holds quite negative implications. Because we feel the need to fix it somehow or bridge it. But if we bridge the gap, then the gap will still exist. So today I want to try and shift your perspective of the gap, treat it not as something that needs to be fixed or cured, but actually as something that needs to be accepted, recognised and understood. In this way, then the gap will be dissolved. The gaps in between the notes in music create the excitement and suspense. <laughs> So let's try and find this energy in the gaps that exist between us all. There are gaps in families between generations. There are gaps in the education system between the pupils and the teachers. Gaps in workplaces and gaps in concert halls. And earlier on this year, my husband and I were at the Wigmore Hall in London, a small, intimate classical music venue where the average audience age is actually probably about 65, 70. But in the row in front of us was a young father and his two daughters, no more than eight years old. They were dressed up for the occasion, had a small supply of sweets, rapless sweets, and seemed very engaged. But halfway through the concert, one of the little girls whispered a question into her daddy's ear, at which point an elderly gentleman in the row in front of her turned round and forcefully shushed her. He did so with such aggression that it represented to me such a huge chasm between them and between his lack of understanding of the way that she was experiencing the concert. Because actually music should be enjoyed by different groups of people, different ages, different social backgrounds, simultaneously. And through my work bringing music into the workplace, I have seen how it's provided as a counterpoint to fix barriers of age, social background, and corporate hierarchy. <laughs> On the surface, choirs and office structures actually share quite a lot of similarities. They're both groups of people, different levels of experience, different levels of expertise, coming together to work towards an end goal or a performance. But the fundamental difference is that singing in a choir offers a changeable hierarchical structure. That's innate within the music itself, within the different elements that the music holds, the harmony, the melody, because they all hold different levels of importance at different times of the music, whilst maintaining an equal responsibility, creating equality within hierarchy. And singing in an office choir it's very common that you have the managing partner standing next to someone's PA, who's standing next to someone in IT, who's standing next to someone in the post room. And on a day-to-day -day basis, these individuals probably don't meet. At least they don't have any much dialogue between them. But coming together and singing together once a week creates a shared activity and a common language, something that they can communicate with and build a new resonance between them. I was talking to two members of the Christie's Choir on researching this talk about how they, what their experience of singing in the choir was. Becca works in the design department of one of the buildings in London, and Tom has worked in the post room for 30 years in the other building in London. And Becca said that for the last couple of years, Tom was really just an email address, someone she communicated regularly with, he coordinated all her incomings and outgoings and ironically was the hub of communication at Christie's. But he remained an email address until they met once a week and he became Tom, a lively, fun, committed member of the choir. There are other ways that music can dissolve gaps, more conscious examples. When I was two weeks old, I had heart surgery, and an effect of this was that the left side of my body and brain was slightly less developed. I had speech therapy at a young age to correct a, a speech impediment that was left over from the trauma 
of the operation. And incidentally, the left side of your brain covers your speech, and the right side of your brain is singing and music. And at a similar age that I had speech therapy, I started having piano lessons with my mother, herself a piano teacher. And I'm sure that my passion for piano playing, making music, and bringing people together through music is rooted in this experience where I had this shared activity and created a dialogue when words were such a, a struggle. And it's a real common theme, actually, in my adult pupils, that they want to learn the piano to be able to help their children practice, something that was previously confined to a practice room, a solitary activity, can then become a shared activity, something that they can communicate with and dissolve any barriers that may be, um, may be coming up between them. People also want to learn how to play nursery rhymes so that they can play to their toddlers, again, creating a different type of activity which, which doesn't rely on the verbal communication. There are also more on a global scale, the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, led by the inspiration of Daniel Barenboim, is an example of youths from Palestine and Israel coming together, communicating in the common language that is music, and beginning to accept each other's different political points of view. And you see that translate to their parents, the older generation, who recognise this new wave of tolerance that's beginning to come through, this new listening and being aware of each other's different opinions. So what is fundamental to all of this is that by recognising the difference, recognising where the gap is and accepting it, and building a new dialogue to foster new understandings, then the gap is dissolved. And we're now going to do an experiment, going to spring something on you, a participatory experiment. And to do this, I'm going to bring on maestro conductor James Davey and leave you in his very capable hands. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, this is a bit of a surprise, um, as uh, you probably weren't expecting to participate exactly in anything uh, from the stage. But um, uh, as Tessa has alluded I, uh, to, I'm a conductor, and I'm one of the conductors um, of, of some of the office choirs that, uh, that uh, Tessa uh, has um, auspices over. And um, so we thought, uh, rather than just um, explaining um, uh, about these um, different uh, things that go on in a singing experience, the best thing was for you to actually experience it yourselves. So um, I'm going to um, uh, tell you, first of all, a little story. Um, in uh, 1871, uh, a, a fire, a, a great fire, swept through the American city of Chicago. And uh, it lasted for three days, destroyed 100,000 homes um, in those three days. And um, the, uh, after the fire, a reporter um, discovered where the fire had originated and suggested that um, a, an Irish lady uh, by the name of Mrs. Catherine O'Leary uh, may have started this fire. Um, at the time, uh, Irish immigrants weren't particularly accepted in um, in Chicago, and so this was, this was a way of, of, of poking at them a bit. And um, Mrs. O'Leary um, uh, uh, obviously contested this, and um, uh, the story then emerged that perhaps it wasn't Mrs. O'Leary that had started this fire, but in fact it was her cow um, in the cow shed knocking over an oil lantern. And uh, uh, the story became such a myth that a song emerged, and, um, and I'm going to teach it to you now. Uh, so I hope you're ready uh, to let loose with your vocal cords. Um, could you all stand up, please, first of all, <clears throat> um, so we can get the, the best out of this. Um, so our song, our song begins, and please um, don't worry if you've, if you've never sung before in your lives, just give it your best, that's all, all we can ask. Um, uh, so our, our story begins with Mrs. O'Leary tripping into her cow shed. Late last night before she went to bed. Late last night before she went to bed. Ex oh, wow, fantastic. <laughs> oh, 
Um, so, we're off to a good start. Um, I'd like to add an action to this, so to get us really in the spirit of, of, uh, of this evening of, of uh, uh, om omnicity. Um, so, we're going to step, tiptoeing, as though you're tiptoeing through your, uh, through your farmhouse, okay? So, um, with very short notes. So, it'll be something like this. Late last night, before she went to bed. Late last night, before she went to bed. Fabulous. And then um, I'd like you to hold up your, your lantern. It's a big glass-encased oil lantern. <laughs> Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed. Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed. Excellent, excellent stuff. And then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said. And then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said. Wow, you're fantastic musicians, really impressed. Uh, can we add, we're going to add an action, so the cow, on the word kick, kicks it over, being a little bit careful about it, and, and winked at her and said, but not just, not just a wink, we, we need to really capture this moment, could you do a full-bodied wink, down to the waist, one of those, okay, so, and then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said... There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Very good. And we're going to add a, um, an interesting action to this, which is I'm going to call flaming fingers. <laughs> Jazz hands are a bit, a bit out of date now, so flaming fingers. Um, yet at the same time, I'd like you to turn in a full circle. So you're going to get... Uh, <laughs> a stereophonic effect of all of the voices around you as you turn. And we're going to start on the word hot, ending on the word night. I'll demonstrate once so you can see what I mean in five steps. So I go, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. OK, OK, one, two, three. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Excellent. Well done. So we've got our four parts of the song. Starts with the tripping. Late last night before she went to bed, Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed, and then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. OK? You ready? Oh, thank you. This, it's your turn. It's your turn. OK. Are you ready? Two, three. Late last night, before she went to bed, Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed, and then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Fabulous. Now, <laughs> so it's a very stimulating activity, singing, as you can see. Um, so we're going to add some extra elements to this um, now uh, to, to use our different perceptions and experiences to um, put them into this song. So we're going to start the first section of the song, Late Last Night. I would like you to sing in your best cathedral chorister <laughs> voice. So imagining that you are now uh, eight or nine years old and you just started at St Paul's Cathedral as a probationer. Late last night before she went to bed, except with the actions at the same time. So here we go, here we go, two, three, four. Late last night, before she went to bed. There's some very big choristers at the back there, so excellent, very good. Um, so, um, yeah, can you, could you make your voice sound as young as possible? So like a, yeah, a very small person, okay? One, two, three. Late last night, before she went to bed. Excellent, very good. And uh, then the second part of the song, Hanging the Lantern in the Shed, I'd like you to be a retired opera singer. So, you know, full of uh, vibrato and all the rest. Show, show me your best. Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed. Your turn. Two, three. Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed. Oh, very operatic. Okay. <laughs> Uh, very good. Uh, on, for the third part of the song, uh, we're going to be um, country and western stars um, in their prime, in their heyday. Um, we'll go for Dolly Parton, your best Dolly Parton. And then a cow kicked it over and 
uh, with the actions, okay? One, two. And then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said, fabulous. And then, and then finally, in your own voice, uh, your own voice, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. One, two. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Very good. So let's put that all together. So what have we got? We've got the cathedral chorister for part one, opera singer, uh, country and western, your own voice. Okay, good luck. Oh, one, two, three. Late last night before she went to bed, Mrs. O'Leary hung a lantern in the shed and then a cow kicked it over and winked at her and said, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Well done, working together really, really well. Um, so uh, now let's see if we can subdivide um, and take, uh, you know, start some new identities and, and some new groupings. So we're going to divide the room right down the middle, so, uh, so into two halves, and then in half again. So somewhere along the middle row, you can decide whether you're, um, you're in the, the upper or lower section there. Um, and we're going to start with this group over here. You're going to be group one, then group two, group three, and group four. And let's see if we can sing this as a round. Okay. Good luck. Good luck. Ready? And one, two, three. Late last night before she went Group two. Late last night before she went to bed. Late last night before she... Group four. Late last night before she... Once more, late last night before she, and again, late last night before she, and group three, late last night before she went to bed, late last night before she, Bravo. Bravo.